Good day everyone, welcome to our next section looking at compression design. So the design of columns, um, sometimes you'll see it referred to as columns, sometimes compression members, but when there is a compressive load, and it doesn't matter how the section is orientated, horizontally, vertically, whatever, as soon as we have a element in compression, we'll be following the, the steps and the details shown in this lecture and the, the next lectures. So Getting into it, we're first going to go through some steel terminology. This is independent of compression design, but and for one thing with, with steel structures is you need to understand how they fit together to be able to get to, to results. Then using compression elements, um, what happens to me members in compression, Euler buckling, P-delta effects, classification buckling, calculations, effective lengths, and class 4 sections. A number of these topics are addressed in other videos, so you'll just need to refer to those. But firstly, just some uh, sort of the, the anatomy of a structure. Here you'll see a little warehouse, a little store that was built, and so you've got the purlins on the roof, so you've got purlins and purlin spacing, you've got knee braces onto the trusses that help stabilize the truss, and then you've got your, your truss spacing here, you've got your gable face, so this is the face where um, you, you the, the truss spans across it, and normally what you do, you just have a column or a column and rafters then, then covering this end bay, and this is called the gable face. You've got bracing, vertical bracing, and roof bracing, girts, so purlins and girts are the same thing. Purlins are just on the roof and girts on the side, and then you've got these things called sag angles here, and the sag angles support the girts and the purlins, they prevent them from buckling, and also practically speaking on site, they prevent them from sagging while you are actually erecting the structure and then putting the sheeting on. And so as some other terminology, you've got your eaves haunch, eaves, roof pitch, apex, rafter, apex haunch, column, etc. So some sort of typical <coughs> terminology that you may need to use in the course. So here are some examples of compression elements. So you might have a column and a column. Uh, you can have horizontal members in cross bracing. So if you've got a compressive force there, this will put that into to compression. You've got truss elements. And uh, depending on the load case, a truss element may be in both uh, compression and in tension. Well, so in different load combinations, their, their forces will swap around. So we can use pretty much any type of section for compression. So whether it's an I, I mean, H section, I beam, square, uh, or rectangle, or square hollow section, rectangle, I mean, circular hollow section, built up sections, um, multiple sections, etc., and then back to back angles and all sorts of things. So Remember, steel designing steel is like putting together a giant Meccano set. You're trying to find an efficient arrangement of steel sections to give you a, a efficient design. When it comes to axes, our main axis is our x-axis, our strong axis. Then with our y-axis vertically, which is our weak. Just be careful. Sometimes the you can have cases. For instance, you have a very short and wide beam. Uh, you've x and y will stay in the same place, but it may have eventually happen if you had a really weird funny looking one like that eventually the strong and the weak axis may actually swap around so um, you, there are some exceptions to x always being the strong and y always being the weak so be careful of that z is the the axis down the length and then you'll also see angles you've got your u and your v axis and uh, yeah here you can see then also a t section there we've got. What happens to a member in compression? So if we have a um, section, we now put load on it, and it has some length L, and we start um, loading this. And it's also got a, a radius of gyration, so let's say it's an I section, and it starts buckling about its um, axis, let's say Y, and it's got an R, Y value. What would the shape of of the graph plotting compressive resistance against slenderness. Well, let's first think if we had a perfect column and it's very short. So we would load it and load it and load it until the material fails. So we would have a short column where we would have an upper bound. And just think about now what would be the limit it, the limit is our yield strength. So we've got a CY value, our yield, and that is equal to just your area times your yield strength. I'm just going to move this up actually, just to make some space. Um, equals area times yield strength. 
now let's take our column and as it gets longer if it was once again a perfect column it would experience what's called Euler or Euler buckling and it gets to a elastic buckling scenario and this provides another limit on the behavior you will never have more capacity than a perfect column in buckling and these two curves define our resistance the um, short column on the one hand and then a long elastic column on the other but in reality columns are not perfect the material has residual stresses in and various other things occur such that we don't have exactly this limit of resistance so what happens is um, you if you plot the resistance if you do a whole bunch of tests and then plot their resistance and join them up with a curve you end up with a uh, a curve that looks like this it's horizontal and origin uh, initially and then drops off and it follows between these two curves falling underneath it and this would be a real column and a real column has as I said residual stresses it's also not perfectly straight and that will cause some behavior it's not you know perfectly geometrically accurate each time and so what will happen is we fit a curve below the two red but it's linked to it so on the one hand we've got yield on the other hand we've got elastic buckling and then this real column behavior and so if we sort of differentiate this into zones we have a short column we have on the other hand somewhere down here we have elastic buckling and then in between the two we've got what's called inelastic buckling so it buckles but it's not perfectly um, elastic at that stage and so we wanted to try to find this blue curve because then it doesn't matter what section we have we can determine the compressive resistance of it and then also just to make a note is this um, behavior here is phi cy because we drop from there to there so it's 90 percent of our, our yield strength and then down here it's roughly also 90 percent well it's actually 90 percent down here as well it's not exactly to scale as i've drawn it and um well it depends on the, the materials actually but um and this this is comparing the south african code the sands the blue line then with these are the european codes so depending also what code you get you will have something following these lines in different ways so the europeans actually have a hundred percent of yield strength where in south africa we only use 90 percent of yield strength and as discussed in our tension element section we do have residual stresses in a section but since the fact that we have a ductile material that um, as we load it up if it reaches its yield it kind of continues on um, in a, a, a plastic fashion if we for instance have residual stresses we apply load or one part yields and one hasn't we add on some more load and all that will happen is these bits will catch up and eventually the whole section will be yielded so uh, we can assume the entire section can carry the yield load even though in reality we do have residual stresses earlier i introduced the idea of the euler or euler buckling load and we're going to do quickly derive this and it might seem a little bit sort of um, theoretical at first but you will see it directly influencing our calculations later and the exact form of what's called the non-dimensional slenderness lambda comes from the buckling load so firstly we have to assume it's perfect pin supports prismatic sections perfectly straight no residual stresses concentric axial load and linear elastic material no torsional strain in reality the column on site didn't quite finish they knocked it in place with a four pound hammer and then um, the material wasn't exactly you know spot on 355 and there was some residual stresses and there was you know half a millimeter out on the cross section etc etc so um we will then convert a perfect column into an imperfect column so just having a look at a column at buckling if we start with the front fun, from fundamental bending behavior monsieur m over i uh, sigma over y e of r this governs pretty much anything in bending you can derive everything from first principle with that equation moment over second moment area equals stress over distance from axis equals young's modulus over radius of curvature and so uh, also, I've 
at some point z, our deflection is uz, our radius is given by that equation, which you would have looked at previously, and, um, or you can actually obtain it from deflection, is u at z, so our slope is the first derivative, and then the curvature is um, linked to the second derivative, the inverse. So now there's our radius, we have our curve, we're looking at some position, what is the moment in there? Our moment is given as such, based upon this, this equation, and so what happens is we now solve for this and we um, solve for unknowns at our boundary conditions and um, ultimately when we solve this we end up with the elastic buckling load. And since the smallest critical load is at n equals 1, we want the smallest load, this is our critical buckling load. So we take a perfect column, we load it up until it um, buckles elastically, that is our buckling load. So the mean buckling stress at this bifurcation point, this maximum load, which either if you drop the stress just before that point, it'll go back to where it was, and if you go just past that point, it, you'll have failed it. So that's why it's bifurcation. Um, you adjust this and play with it to turn it into a stress, a critical stress. So we've got a critical load and we divide that by area. Now we have A over I, and R is the square root of I over A. Plug that in, do a little bit of messing around, and we end up with a slenderness um, that takes into account the L over R, the critical buckling, and then the slenderness at the material yield point. So this is the slenderness at the point where it yields. Um, we're linking these two curves together. I'm just going to, sorry, I want to go back there. This point here, we're linking everything and saying, well, that's also a useful point. Um, and we take the ratio of the elastic buckling stress to our yield stress, and we end up with this formula. So this takes into account when will it buckle? When will it yield? And then our physical length of the column and the radius of gyration. This is used to define the shape of that blue curve earlier. So this is important to knowing how much buckling occurs. Is it zero amount of buckling? So that we have a short column or is it a lot of buckling? So that it buckles very quickly and ends up being a long column. So Let's continue now with some other concepts. So I'm basically trying to give you now all the different ingredients that you need to design columns. Another issue is you have braced and unbraced structures, and we will cover this at multiple points in this course, but a frame with no bracing will sway when lateral loading is applied. As the structure deflects by delta, it will induce additional bending moments in those columns, which have an applied load P. This leads to P delta effects, which has um, to be explicitly accounted for during design. Um, you can actually account for this, for instance, in Procon, but one thing you can think of is a sway frame is something where that is not zero, where for this, the deflection here is approximately zero. It's never perfectly zero, um, but it, it's close enough to zero that can be ignored. So, for instance, when you've got a brace structure and you've got a piece of steel, when you put a load on here, this only elongates by a very small amount, this tension member. You ignore the compression one, so it becomes a zero force member. Um, and this member elongates by a small amount, so overall the structure hardly moves to carry the load. Where this one, you put the load, it's still safe, but it, they say deflects five or ten mils. It sways horizontally, where this one, the, the deflection's approximately zero. And the P-delta effect, we do need to account for when it starts getting large. And so just to illustrate this point, imagine we've got a cantilever, horizontal load, point load, or axial load, the deflection is such, and then, whoops, wow, now once it's deflected, you end up with some additional deflection. So you have a second order effect. And so now this would be the total deflection, um, including that first order effect. And so what will actually happen is with time, it, each increment, it'll increase by a tiny amount more, but it will ultimately converge depending on the slenderness. And so we can get a... Um, deflection that progressively increases as a function of the axial load and the horizontal load. And so what you'll actually find is that depending on the value of P, you'll get to a stage where this becomes unstable and you'll see that the deflections go off to infinity as 
the, the load increases. And so that's where you have a P delta effect starting to become dominant. In this early stage, P delta effects are not a problem. As we get further down this line, the P delta effect becomes more and more dominant in our design. So when it comes to the design of columns, these are some of the sections you need to understand, and we will cover this in a separate video. Um, but also, you're going to need to understand section classification, refer to the section classification video. And we're going to now go through buckling. We have different types of buckling, and buckling is something you can see. You take a ruler, you squash the ruler, the ruler will buckle out. And depending on the geometry of section, you'll get quite defined buckling behavior. And so flexural buckling is when it moves sideways. So here, if this is your Y, your Y is your axis of symmetry. And now, if this moves sideways, you then have an FEX if it buckles to there, and an FEY when it buckles. I'm just going to quickly call this Y primed here, and you'll see why um, just now. So um, FEY primed. So this is about an updated um, axis. Um, then, so this is it actually, you load it and load it, and then it physically moves sideways. It buckles about X or about Y, and it moves sideways. This is called FEX, FEY. I'm going to call it FEY primed. Torsional bucking is when you load it, and it actually twists about an axis. So there's a centroid, and it actually rotates about that position. And that is FEZ. That's an elastic buckling stress. So... For instance, it hits 50 MPA and it then experiences um, elastic buckling. Then you also get a flexural torsional buckle. So it moves from here to here. It moves both sideways and rotates. So this is FEYZ. And these will all happen at different stresses. And the, the, the weakest one will happen first. So that might be 100 MPA, 70 MPA, 50 MPA, and 30 MPA or something. And you will load it up and eventually one of these buckling modes will, will kick in, assuming buckling occurs before yielding. And so we need to find where is that point. Angles, unequal angles, channels and the likes can undergo multiple failure modes due to different types of buckling. Each of these influence the capacity of col columns. The non-dimensional slenderness is found based on the smallest of these elastic buckling stresses. So a column may experience any of them, depending on its shape. And so we will go through, when we look at the code, which buckling stress you use for which type. And so when you have a look at an asymmetric section, I'm covering this first, this is actually the most complex, but this is a general equation which applies to anything. This is any type of cross-section you can design using this. And you will solve for FE. FEX, FEY, FEZ, you can solve for, and, well, you can calculate based on properties, but ultimately you will come back and you will calculate what is FE. You'll have to find the root, you'll need a spreadsheet or a numerical method or your calculator and try a few times, and you eventually solve for this elastic buckling stress. That will be the perfect column when it buckles. Once I have that, then I can go from that r r dotted red line earlier to the blue line. So I can get an elastic stress and then find a buckling, um, then a, a sort of a real column buckling failure. Now, just as a, a separate note, I've just listed here that may be something of use. If asymmetric sections are not common, but if you do, it's normally an unequal angle. And here's some ways of calculating geometric properties that you'll need where X naught and Y naught are the distance from the centroid to the shear center. Centroid to shear center. X naught is distance along X. Y naught is distance up X. And so you rotate the axes and then you need to calculate X naught and Y naught. If these two are on top of each other, that's good. It doesn't experience the same sort of twisting behavior. If as they get further apart, you have more and more twisting behavior. Singly symmetric sections, Fe will be the minimum of x and y, x primed, but the y axis is the axis of symmetry. So I'm going to say this in a few of the videos, I make my y axis y prime, just to remind me that it is something different. 
and uh, I update it. And if you want, it's probably even better just to put it in all the different places um, to remind you that this is a updated axis. So it says these calculations apply when the axis of symmetry is adjusted to be the y axis. So what I do is I rotate everything and then I swap the values around. So now my y primed is actually my u value. So I'll use um, all my u axis properties in y primed and refer to the, the, the worked examples if that's not making sense. But you rotate the whole section and then you just are very careful in what values you plug in where. So your y axis is always your axis of symmetry in a singly symmetric section. This is the way you design it and you account for the difference between the shear center and the centroid, shear center and centroid as follows. Just as a note, um, if you have an, an, a, a, an equal angle, the shear center occurs halfway through the thickness. So this you can work out, it's the distance to there and that's half the thickness in from the edge, half the thickness, half the thickness in. So that you can work out. This you will find in the red book, the shear center of the channel and then same thing with the T-beam, uh, you'll find it half the thickness there. So uh, that's just um, yeah, just a note of how you actually find this y-bar value. Now, um, singly symmetric angles here, as I've, I've listed what I was just discussing, and then also CW, its warping stiffness is approximately zero. We will discuss warping stiffness um, more when we get to um, beam design. And as I said, be very careful about the axes moving and using Rx primed equals Rv and Ry primed equals Ru for angles. Some guides such as the red book change the subscripts to avoid confusion, but I normally just do that. And um, we will cover an example. You can have a look at example 4.2 from the red book. It provides a good worked example um, on the design of compression elements. It goes through all the calculations in it. So how do we go about designing a section now? So firstly, this is the sort of methodology we'll follow. So firstly, classify the section, find the slenderness, KL of R, determine the applicable elastic buckling stress, then we get to our non-dimensional stress we covered, then we calculate the compressive load. We will cover this in the, the code, bait, the code um, uh, video, but this ultimately is a load times a buckling factor. So this is that, that blue line I showed you earlier. This is a real column. This equation is empirical, has been calibrated to calculate failure loads based on the non-dimensional slenderness, which is based on elastic buckling stress. Whether it be lateral torsion or lateral torsional buckling, doesn't matter which is your FE value, you pick the lowest one, FEY, FEZ, FEX, etc., etc., and you plug that in to get your non-dimensional slenderness, and then you get your resistance. The actual stress in the column at failure can be calculated as follows. If the section is class 4, you adjust the cross-sectional area. And just a final sort of thought to consider. I've been talking about the radius of gyration, and you should be familiar with this R, this radius of gyration, from earlier statics courses and strength of material courses. But what is useful is if you can get a sort of practical idea in your mind of what it means. Yes, we can calculate the sec it's the square root of the second moment of area divided by area. However, a practical way to think about R is the average distance of material from the neutral axis. It's, this is not a perfect definition. This is a bit proximate, but I like it because at least I can see if I've made a mistake in my R value or what my R value should be. For instance, this is a 203, 203, 46. So it's about 203 mils deep and wide. If I go about the X axis, on average, most of the material is about, about 88 mils up or 88 mils down from the middle. So my R value is 88.1. Same way, the average material, if this is 200 mil deep, is roughly there and there. So it's roughly a quarter, 200 divided by 4 is 50, yep, it's about 51 mils. I've ignored the bit in the middle. And so this is a practical way of thinking about it. Same way with um, circular hollow sections, the average material distance from the axis is about that, about 75 mils for a 220 mil diameter circular hollow section. And so if you calculate an R value and your R value is outside of the section, you've probably made a mistake because 
it is based upon the sort of linking of second moment of area to area. So when you have a look at it, that will also start make, help you think why is, for instance, Rx stronger than Ry? The further material is about an axis, so as my section gets deeper and deeper, it's harder and harder for it to buckle. So it's stronger and stronger. So a strong axis equals high R value. So you can compare your R values and you'll very quickly see which axis is the weakest. And so that's a, a useful way to start thinking about uh, these aspects. Final thing, just effective lengths. For section KX and KLY are the effective lengths about the axis listed above, normally strong and weak, but swaps for singly and um, symmetric, asymmetric sections. Now, KZLZ refers to effective length and torsion. Now, if unless you're told otherwise, you can take KZ as one. The effective length and torsion. Um, LZ is the distance between any points which will prevent the section from twisting, but KZ is one. Um, you can pretty much take that as a given in our course, but there are guidelines, there are international guidelines to go beyond that, but for the sake of our course we are not, and so that's just the effective length for torsion. Okay, with that, that brings us to the end of the introduction, and so the rest of the videos will follow on and I'll fill in the gaps with these um, different components. Thank you.